All right, good morning. Um, I guess or afternoon or evening, wherever you are, or sometime in between. Um, so what I am looking at, well, let's first of all say, uh, for those of you in the States, uh, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, those of you elsewhere, I hope you're doing well during this strange time in our world's history. Um, I am here in my home. It's quiet. I had my children over the holiday, um, Thanksgiving holiday, so I did not uh, release any videos. So here I am today. It's nice and foggy and cold outside this November 30th, 2020. Just the way I like it. Uh, maybe that's a Scorpio thing or something. I'm not quite sure I enjoy fall and winter. More than the summer, there are some outdoor activities that I enjoy during the summertime and some working and gardening. Uh, none of that's really a part of my reality at this moment, but um, I look forward to getting back into that again. So with the books, uh, Way of the Ascetics, Tito Coliander, St. Vladimir Seminary Press, let me just uh, read to you about this uh, book here. Way of the Ascetics, Tito Coliander. This rich, compact introduction to Eastern Christian spiritual tradition provides insightful reflections on self-control and inner peace. Coliander includes succinct yet profound extracts from the spiritual fathers with illuminating commentary and practical applications for daily devotion. Tempering austerity with common sense, warmth, and even humor. The author writes as much for persons living fully in the world as for monastics. Way of the Ascetics is excellent source for daily meditation, authentic spiritual guidance, and revitalization, revitalized religious life. Tito Coliander was born in St. Petersburg's Russia and lived most of his life in Helsinki, Finland, where he was an Orthodox layman and author of several books in both the religious and secular fields. I think a little bit more about him is that he was, yeah, trained in the arts. Uh, him and his wife are converts into Orthodoxy. I know his son became a priest. And... Um, I don't really know too much else about him. He did attend seminary, uh, I suppose. And yeah, that he was Finnish. So this book was given to me by um, a priest at an old Russian Orthodox parish that I attended. And so I guess we will talk a little bit about it and asceticism in general. Um, asceticism is just definitely a part of the... Orthodox Church, uh, as an Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, I would urge you to study about asceticism. Uh, my life's journey, not only have I studied about it, I guess I could talk a little personal things about asceticism. It's something that I was definitely drawn to, and I think it's some of it's contrary, not contrary, but not as common, certainly not in evangelicalism. Um, and not as much in Puritan or um, uh, Protestantism. I guess you could definitely find it in some lives of the Puritans. And uh, I think someone like John Calvin um, practiced a lot of asceticism. If you look at his sleep schedule and work schedule and study schedule and diet... Um, and essentially, it can be um, something that is really extreme or even maybe minimal. There can be small forms of self-denial as well as um, huge forms of self-denial. And I think anything in between that. So the spectrum is pretty broad there. Um, yeah, so, and I'm just um, waking up and enjoying some coffee, so I'm going to have a sip of coffee, and we can discuss that more, um, but, you know, um, I like that about this book. I know there's a part in here that he mentions um, even just the self-denial act of foregoing a cigarette, so um, definitely written in a different time period and discussing, like, um, I guess maybe when smoking would be more frequent or common. Um, type of practice 
and just foregoing a cigarette as an act of devotion and as an act of self-denial. Oftentimes, um, prayer, fasting, night watches. Um, so for me, I wasn't. I don't know if I was going to get into too much personal. Uh, asceticism has been a part of my life. There was been parts of my life when I greatly practiced it. Um, and other times where there's just minimal things that I did, such as as I was participating in the life of a community uh, at an orthodox um, parish, keeping the fast in accordance with the church calendar um, and particular fast days, um, days of abstaining from sex with my um, wife at the time, um, many different things. Um, also times of just, um, extra prayerfulness and watchfulness and, um, readings and, um, time to seek and press into things of the spirit as opposed to things of the flesh or the bodily. And I do think as being a practitioner of, uh, um, not, uh, as someone who professionally, um, was educated, um, in, the medical field and worked in mental health, psychiatry, there are concerns that can arise perhaps um, in relation to mind-body dualities or um, and maybe in more spiritual or religious terms, um, mind or spirit body um, dualities um, or where someone's kind of... Um, has a problem or different hang-ups about their body, and so they're practicing aesthetic practices um, maybe as a result of that. But uh, let's get into this book because I do think that there is some guidance here that is offered for both the lay person um, and the monastic or um, clergy as well. So, <clears throat> The Way of the Ascetics. The Way of the Ascetics. The Ancient Tradition of Discipline and Inner Growth, Tito Coleander, translation by Catherine Fieri, introduction by Kenneth Leach, St. Vladimir Seminary, Crestwood, New York. Contents. Introduction. On a resolute and sustained purpose. On the insufficiency of human strength. 3. On the garden of the heart. 4. On the silent and invisible warfare. 5. On the denial of self and the cleansing of the heart. 6. On eradicating the desire for enjoyment. 7. On the transfer of love from the self to Christ. 8. On guarding against the reentry of vanquished evil. 9. On the conquest of the world. 10. On the sins of others and one's own. 11. On the inner warfare as a means to an end. 12. On obedience. 13. On progress and depth. 14. On humility and watchfulness. 15. On prayer. 16. On prayer. 17. On prayer. 18. On prayer. 19. On the bodily and mental accompaniments of prayer. 20. On fasting. 21. On the avoidance of extravagance. 22. On the use of material things. 23. On times of darkness. 24. On an interpretation of Zacchaeus. 25. On the Jesus prayer. 26. On the pearl of great price. <clears throat> List of fathers and authors. A note on the Philokalia index. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm going to take a sip of coffee and then I'll read you a little bit from this great work. Introduction. In the last two decades, both the degree of secularization and the extent of the resurgence of interest in spirituality have been grossly exaggerated. To some extent, the exaggeration of the former led to that of the latter, so one saw the remarkable volte face of those who in the 1960s had hailed the secular city and the death of God 
appearing equally uncritically as protagonists of Eastern mysticism in the 70s. Of course, our society never became totally secular, totally irreligious, and the current spiritual revival has not affected much, oh, has not affected as all groups of society to the same extent. Much of our culture remains consistently conventional, as much in its religion as in its general attitudes, and nothing is more opposed to true, true spirituality than conventional religion. From such religion, atheism is a liberating experience. Nevertheless, the rejection of conventional religion has led many to explore more deeply the resources of Christian traditions other than and deeper in their own. Although we have heard a good deal about the popularity of non-Christian spiritual disciplines from the East, an equally striking phenomena has been the rediscovery of the Eastern Christian traditions in the United States today. The Orthodox churches are an integral part of the religious scene, yet many Western Christians are only beginning to become familiar with the richness of Orthodoxy, its theology, its liturgical life, its concern with the inner life of prayer, that can do so much to enrich and deepen our often superficial religious life. It is with the spiritual tradition of Eastern Orthodoxy that Tito Coliandra is concerned in this volume. Originally published some 30 years ago in Swedish, drawing on collected sayings of holy men of the East, he presents for the Western readers something of the atmosphere of Orthodox spirituality. For Orthodoxy is not primarily a system or a correctness of doctrinal formulations. Doxa means glory. Orthodoxy is therefore concerned with right glory, and it is therefore rooted in the sense of theology as inseparable from human transformation. The purpose of theology is nothing less than a transfiguration of human life from glory to glory. At the center of Orthodox theology and spirituality is the theme of theosis, deification, the raising of manhood into God. This is the aim of the liturgy, the Eucharistic celebration which stands at the center of all worship and all life. But the centrality of the liturgy is set against the background of what Orthodox theologians describe as the world as sacrament, the material world as vehicle, not the enemy of the spirit. All spirituality has a material basis, as St. John Damascene expressed it. We venerate matter because the creator of matter became material and through matter affected our salvation. So the creation of the Incarnation are at the heart of Orthodox spiritual disciplines. This participation in the liturgy and this sense of communication of the divine through material things expressed supremely in the icons that are so central to Orthodox worship is taken for granted by the ascetical writers whose thoughts are gathered here. They take for granted too that the Christian disciple who is serious about his or her progress will have a spiritual guide, a pneumaticus pater, pater um, the spiritual father is what that means, um, whom the deepest thoughts of the soul will be shared. This valuable collection must not be read then as a private handbook for self-cultivation. The orthodox spiritual guides are totally opposed to this privatizing of religion, which is so popular now. They stress the need of the common life of the sacramental community, of the unity of liturgy and contemplation. They stress to the need for the progress in depth, chapter 13, and the place of prayer in the spiritual conflict. Most of all, they stress the attainment of purity of heart, of the inner stillness and silence, hesekeia, which comes from the practice of prayer, the prayer of Jesus. Through such spiritual discipline, waiting on God in solitude, we come to realize the kinship to God that we, as his image, share. The rediscovery of orthodoxy in the West is not only important in terms of the quest for Christian unity, it is essential if we are to recover that lost sense of mystical and prayerful character of all theology. All theology is mystical theology, all theology is social theology, but it is rooted in the life hidden with Christ. In God and in the social life, the Holy Trinity, this unity of the mystical and social is something we have largely lost in the West, where Christians are often divided into pietists and social activists. The Orthodox know no such distinction. Both the personal life of the heart, the Eastern term for the center of personality, and the corporate life of human society are to be transfigured. 
So the way of the ascetics is not a gloomy world denying path. It is a way of doxa to glory whose aim is nothing less than our deification. The small volume intended to be read slowly, meditated upon, used and reused, even learned by heart, can itself become part of our spiritual resources as we move from one degree of glory to another. Kenneth Leach, 22 July, 1981. Note, this work is based on the Holy Fathers of the Orthodox Church and consists largely of direct and freely rendered extracts from their writings, together with some necessary interpretation and practical application. Scriptural quotations are from the authorized version, except those from the Psalms which follow the prayer book Psalter. Okay, take another drink of coffee and uh, we'll look at a little bit more. All right, on a resolute and sustained purpose. If you wish to save your soul and win eternal life, arise from your lethargy, make the sign of the cross, and say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Faith comes not through pondering, but through action. On the insufficiency of human strength, the Holy Fathers say with one voice, the first thing to keep in mind is never in any respect to rely on yourself. The warfare that now lies before you is extraordinarily hard and your own human powers are altogether insufficient to carry on. If you rely on them, you will immediately be felled to the ground and have no desire to continue the battle. Only God can give you the victory you wish. On the Garden of the Heart the new life you have just entered has often been likened to that of the gar gardener. The soil he tills he has received from God, as well as the seed and the sun's warmth and the rain and the power to grow. But the work is entrusted to him. On the silent and invisible warfare, now that we know where the battle we have just begun to fight is to be fought, and what and where our goal is, we also understand why our warfare ought to be called the invisible warfare. It all takes place in the heart and in silence, deep within us and in another serious matter on which the Holy Fathers lay much stress. Keep your lips tight shut on your secret. If one opens the door of the steam bath and the heat escapes, the treatment loses its benefit. There's another part about um, keeping those things to yourself concerning spiritual disciplines and asceticism. Say nothing of the new life you have begun or the experience you are making and the experiences you expect to have. All this matters between God and you and only between you two. The only exception might be your father confessor. The denial of self and the cleansing of the heart. Naked, small, and helpless, you now pass on to the most difficult of all human tasks, to conquer your own selfish desires. Ultimately, it is just this, self-persecution on which your warfare depends. For as long as your selfish will rules, you cannot pray to the Lord with a pure heart. Thy will be done. If you cannot get rid of your own greatness, neither can you lay yourself open for real greatness. If you cling to your own freedom, you cannot share in true freedom. For only one reigns. <laughs> James says, Purify your hearts. 4 8. The Apostle Paul instructs us to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. 2 Corinthians 7 1. For whom within, says Christ, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and e the evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Mark seven twenty one through 3. Therefore he also exhorts the Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, and the outside of them may be clean. Matthew twenty three twenty six. On eradicating the desire for enjoyment. 
It is said that only a few find the narrow way that leads to life, and that we must strive to enter in by the narrow door. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able to. Luke 13, 24. You must set about rooting out every desire to have pleasant things, to get on well, to be contented. You must learn to be to like sadness, poverty, pain, hardship. You must learn to follow privately the Lord's bidding, not to speak empty words, not to adorn yourself, always to obey authority, not to look at a woman with desire, not to be angry at and much else. For all these biddings are given to us in order for us to act as they did not exist. But for us to follow, otherwise the Lord of mercy would not have burdened us with them. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, said Matthew sixteen twenty four, thereby leaving it to each person's own will. If any man will, and to each person's endeavor, let him deny himself. On the transfer of love from the self to Christ. If we move out of ourself, whom do we encounter? Ask Bishop Theophon. He supplies the answer at once. We meet God and our neighbor. It is for this very reason that denying oneself is a stipulation, and the chief one for the person who seeks salvation in Christ. Only so can the center of our being be moved from self to Christ, who is both God and our neighbor. The obstinate will to personal happiness is the cause of unrest and division in your soul. Give it up and work against it, and the rest will be given to you without effort. <clears throat> On guarding against the reentry of vanquished evil. The first time you are victorious over self may be the sign to you, now I am on the way. But do not consider yourself virtuous, only thank God, for it was he who gave you the power. And do not rejoice beyond measure, but swiftly go on. Otherwise the vanquished evil may come to light and conquer you from the rear. Remember, the Israelites received a command from God to drive out the inhabitants of the land when they conquered the new land, Numbers 33:52, in order that we might learn from them. Do not be hesitant, do not be afraid of disappearing like them. From this adulterous and sinful generation, what are you hoping to win, the world or your soul? Mark eight thirty four to thirty eight. Woe to you when all men shall speak well of you. Luke six twenty six. On the conquest of the world, Saint Basil, the Great says, one cannot approach the knowledge of the truth with a disturbed heart. Therefore, we must try to avoid everything that disturbs our heart, that causes forgetfulness, excitement, or passion or that we awakens unrest. We must free ourselves as much as possible from all fuss and flutter and ado over vain things. Yes, when we serve the Lord, we shall not be troubled about many things. But always keep in mind the one thing is needful. Luke 10.41 On the sins of others in one's own. Now that you have thus become aware of your own wretchedness, your insufficiency, and your wickedness, you call upon the Lord as did the publican, Luke 18, 13. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And you add, Behold, I am far worse than the publican, for I cannot resist I and the Pharisee askance, and my heart is proud, and says, I thank thee that I am not like him. But say the saints, now that you recognize the darkness in your own heart and the weakness of your flesh, you lose all desire to pass judgment on your neighbor. Out of your own darkness you see the heavenly light that shines in all created things reflected the clearer. You cannot detect the sins of others while your own are so great. For it is your eager striving for perfection that you first perceive your own imperfection, and only when you have seen your imperfection can you be perfected. Thus... Perfection proceeds out of weakness. The inner warfare and a means to an end. By throwing off the outer bonds, you throw off the inner as well. While you are freeing yourself from external concerns, your heart is freed from inner pain. It follows from this that the hard warfare you are compelled to wage with yourself is exclusively a means. As much as neither good or bad, the saints often liken the prescribed cure, however painful it may be, 
to follow out. It nevertheless remains only a means to regain health. All right, well, I'm just going to look through maybe a little bit more. Um, this is probably good here. St. John Climacus. Obedience is another indispensable implement in the struggle against your selfish will. With obedience, you cut off your physical members. The better to be able to serve with the spiritual, says St. John Climacus. And again, obedience is the grave of your own will. But from it rises humility. For the wind... It was a matter of indifference, whether it was used or not. But for the sailor, it was a means of reaching his destination sooner. Thus you should think of obedience and all the means that are offered us by the Holy Trinity and not the way. On progress and death. On humility and watchfulness. Hmm. So, yeah, this is a good little book to check out um, for spiritual development. Like it says in the introduction, usually you'd want to have the guidance of a spiritual advisor, spiritual father or whatnot, to truly put these things into practice. It's never recommended to be done as a solitary practice, um, unless you have really good guidance, like someone, of course, hermits and recluses practice asceticism, but also they um, have had spiritual formation years and years of um, seeking advice from spiritual father. Um, so, but check this book out. It's definitely a good read. And um, I'm just showing you some of the list of the fathers and authors mentioned in this book. Here, the Elder Ambrose, Andrew of Crete. Holding my phone is... I'm discussing this filming here. Anthony the Great, Basil the Great, Dorotheus, Ephraim, Hezekiah of Jerusalem, Isaac of Syria, the Abbot Isaiah, John Chrysostom, John Climacus, Marcarius of Egypt, Nicetas, Stethos, Theophon, Theophylact. A note on the Philokalia. Most of the fathers referred to in this book are represented in the Philokalia, or Philokalia, which is a collection of extracts from the works of Eastern fathers extending roughly over a thousand years, which end with the 14th century. Their original compilation was made in Greek and first published in Venice, 1782. The celebrated, I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name, P-A-I-S-S-Y-V-E-L-I-T-C-H-K-O-V-S-K-Y Translated into Church Slavonic 12 years later and thereby exercised considerable influence on the religious life in Russia. In the following century, Bishop Theophon made a Russian version of the Philokalia, the title of the Slavonic and Russian versions of the Dubrotuleobi. <clears throat> Some passages of the Philokalia, notably those treating prayer of the heart and the Jesus prayer, have been translated into English from the Russian version by E. 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 Kadlowski and C. E. H. Palmer. I guess Philip Sherard and um, <clears throat> uh, Bishop Callistos Ware also were uh, part of those translations, as far as I know. And published by Faber and Faber in 1951 under the title Writings of the Philokalia and Prayer of the Heart. The following are the names of several simple and easily obtained books in English which will be interest to the readers of the way of the ascetics, orthodox spirituality by a monk of the Eastern Church. That is a great book just written, just titled by a, a monk of the Eastern Church. I think that they do know the actual author of that, and I think that, that you can find that information out. But anyways, that's how he originally published it. The Way of the Pilgrim and the Pilgrim Continues Its Way, translated from the anonymous Russian by R. M. French, new edition of one volume illustrated in London, SPCK, 1954, and a manual of Eastern Orthodox Prayers, New York, St. Vladimir Seminary. I have these. I don't have this right now. Um, however, it's easily obtainable. I don't know if I'll be getting it or not. I can definitely discuss this one, The Way of the Pilgrim. The Pilgrim Continues His Way. And I can discuss this, the Manual of Eastern Orthodox Prayers um, from St. Vladimir's Seminary. 
Press. I believe I have that in my personal library at this time. Um, from that was gifted to me as a friend. I wouldn't necessarily buy prayer books from Saint Vladimir's Seminary myself, only as a matter of personal preference, not because of any thing that I would have against them, um, but I do have that because it was gifted to me from a friend that was a member of the Orthodox Church of America. I would say that I am not. I have attended parishes that are or OCA, but I've never been very interested in joining one. So I just um, prefer not only old calendar, but um, there's just several different things there that I won't get into today. Um, however, I can also discuss... Um, the Way of the Pilgrim, I think I've done a video maybe a year, year and a half ago um, showing those books and um, perhaps we can discuss them more in depth. I'm not going to try to get the focus of my channel on just Orthodox literature though. I'm going to talk about a lot of things that involve traditionalism and traditionalist literature and not just Christian. So that's that. I am Justin William Savoy. I hope you, you have enjoyed this video as we discussed The Way of the Ascetics by Tito Coliander, St. Vladimir Seminary Press. Um, wherever you are this November 30th, 2020, um, may the peace of God be upon you. I hope that you and your loved ones are doing well. And I will be posting more videos soon. As always, you can reach me at SavoyJustin123 at gmail.com. S-U-V-O-Y-J-U-S-T-I-N-123 at gmail.com. There's the best way to uh, um, ask me or consult me if you're thinking about maybe giving to this channel. Uh, eventually, I want to um, do some more things with this channel and keep on providing content for you all. All right. Talk to you soon. Peace.